Thanks, Jared. I'm just logging in here. I'm excited to be here. So tonight, um, my talk is titled, A Common Model Separated by Two Disciplines, Bayesian Factorization Machines with Stan and R. Uh, I'm going to hold. That mic might uh, Testing, okay. testing. Good. Hello. Um, I'm Adam Loretig, and so tonight we'll be talking about factorization machines. I'll go through what they are, how we fit them, and I'll first simulate um, the data generating process for this model and illustrate some stand code for how to fit them. Um, and I'll start with a sort of simple, straightforward model, and then we'll extend this to a hierarchical model. Finally, we'll end with some real data analysis, and I'll show you some of the cool plotting you can do with this model. So. Who am I? I'm the senior data scientist at Just Capital. Um, and I just want to note that all views are mine alone. They don't represent my employer, or any of its funders, or anyone other than me. Um, I received my PhD in political science from The Ohio State University. And I got my bachelor's in political science from Grinnell College. And I've worked on word embeddings, causal inference, Bayesian stats, discrete choice models. And I'm more than happy to talk about any of those with anyone who cares to chat or listen. So I wanted to start off thinking about what, why we model. So I think of there as basically being like three reasons you might model data. Um, descriptive inference, you want to know, is there an association between x and y? Um, prediction, you have some uh, covariates and an outcome, and you want to know what is your outcome for a new set of covariates. And causal inference, where you want to know, does changing x change y? And I've got a book chapter where I talk about this in a little more detail. And I think sort of thinking about why you model can help inform the sorts of models you choose to use. Um, and one set of models that I think you know, can also fit in this framework that I'm going to extend tonight are latent variable models and, or unsupervised models, where the idea is you're learning parameters to reconstruct your observed data. And if you're coming out of computer science, you're probably doing this for prediction. If you're a social scientist, you're doing this for inference. So you've probably encountered these models in some form or another, principal components analysis, factor analysis, other matrix factorization models, ideal point models. Um, if you ever read 538 and see DW nominate, that's an ideal point model, or word to vec for word embeddings. And the basic idea behind all of these models is you have some data matrix X with N rows and J columns, and it'll be decomposed into two low rank matrices. And I'll call these gamma, which is N rows by K columns, and delta, which is k rows by j columns. Um, and then depending on the assumptions you'll make about the structure of gamma and delta, um, you can get a variety of different models. Factorization machines are cool because they combine uh, both a supervised and an unsupervised model. Um, it's a regression on your observable data with a latent variable model on your residuals. And you can plug and play with any generalized linear model. And you may say to yourself, why? And the answer, we'll start with a little explanation. So if you have a regression model for one observation, and you have categor categorical predictors, say country year data, you have an outcome, y, you have the parameters you'll estimate, beta, and you have an error term. And so if you're running this fixed effects regression in R, this is what your model looks like. LM factor group 1 plus factor group 2. But say you want to interact these, so you now have um, factor group 1 plus factor group 2 plus group 1 times group 2. And so you'll have a parameter for every interaction in addition to each of your main effects. Problem is that you can only estimate this beta 3 for your observed interactions. And that as n and j grow, you have an additional n parameters for every j and vice versa. So this can, you can get a parameter explosion really quickly, and they can be pretty poorly estimated if you don't have many observations in any of these groups. So the solution is a factorization machine, where you replace beta 3 with the dot product of low rank latent factors. Um, continuing with the notation from before, if you have two groups, group 1 will be gamma, which is n by k, and group 2 will be delta, which is j by k. And then beta 3 before it, what is now uh, gamma times delta transpose. And so this gives you a scalar that's then added to your coefficients in the model estimation. So this is what your regression model now looks like. So you have your outcome, your main effects, and then your interaction term here. And so the interaction is just a scalar added into this model. 
So the advantage of this is, the, is that the low rank structure regularizes the interaction term. That is, you have a set of parameters you're learning and they're constrained as they grow and you don't need to observe an interaction to predict it. Uh, you can get an interaction as long as you identify a member of each group. Um, and so the basic factorization machine model here, um, we have our outcome model, where, which is normally distributed. We have our two main effects. We have our dot product. And here throughout this, um, unless I otherwise noted, I'm assuming our y is normally distributed and continuous. And you have, so you'll have a standard deviation. Your beta coefficients on your main effects are distributed normally with mean of zero in some standard deviation. And then your interact, the elements of your factorization matrix are distributed normally um, with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Uh, all these slides will be available online, and I think they're available now, actually. So um, each element of this factorization matrix is distributed normally, and we're assuming no structure about their correlation here. So one of the bits of advice I was given um, as a graduate student is whenever you see a fancy new method and you want to learn how to use it, simulate data from it. Like write down what the data generating process is. So um, all the code in here is also available in a Git repo. And much like a cooking show where they chop up the onions in advance and just have them prepped in bowls, all the code here has been sort of portioned out so it looks nice. But it's all available in scripts you can run online. So um, what we'll do is we'll set the number of levels for each of our covariates. Here we'll do 100 for our first group, uh, 20 for our second, and number of latent dimensions will be 5. So what we'll do is we'll use the expand grid command, which is this really great command if you're ever working with categorical data. It'll give you every combination of two factors. And so then we'll use the sparse model matrix command to um, create a matrix for all of these factors and then uh, combine them so that what we have is a two column matrix with our indices. And so the advantage of this is it's very lightweight in terms of memory because it's only growing long, it's not growing wide. Uh, and so this will be useful when we fit the model in Stan in a few moments. Uh, to simulate our regression part of the equation, we'll uh, draw some betas, and then we'll multiply our x's times our simulated betas, and we get this linear predictor term. And so this is basically, if you wanted to simulate an OLS model, how you do it. Next. Uh, okay, next we'll simulate our latent factors. And what I'll use here is a distribution known as an LKJ distribution. And what this is is a distribution over correlation matrices. So um, this eta term is the sort of tuning parameter of the model, and it's bounded zero to positive infinity. And as it goes to positive infinity, it collapses over an identity matrix. Um, if it's one, it's just a uniform correlation matrix. So you'll have a diagonal of ones, and then off diagonal will range from negative one to one. And so we'll get our correlation terms here. And then we'll, use, we'll simulate a multivariate normal using that correlation matrix and a mean of zero for each of our latent factors. And then what we'll do is we'll go through and get each of our terms from our predictor matrix before, take their dot product, and create this factor terms matrix, which will be um, n times j rows by one column. And then we'll add our linear predictor, our factor terms, and we'll add a little bit of noise to the model. So that's just our random error term noise. So I fit these models in STAN. And STAN is a probabilistic programming language. What that means is that the variables in STAN are associated with distributions. And it provides a way to estimate your models and fit them. So it's incredibly powerful for Bayesian modeling. And one of the reasons I really like it is that the STAN developers have spent a lot of time building tools to make it useful. There are lots of um, diagnostics for models, so you can tell if it's fitting well. It'll give you lots of warnings to warn you if things aren't working in your model. Um, and there's a lot of libraries, including the base plot library, which I use later on, to visualize the results of your model. So there's an ecosystem to work with. So a STAN model has basically three blocks in the code, uh, the data block, the parameters block, and the model block. So data is what you're giving it. 
there are things that aren't estimated. They're either data or uh, values you're providing. And so you have to declare types and stands. So what we'll do is we have our number of group one, group two observations and our number of latent dimensions. Um, we have our covariate matrix, which is the n times j by two. And so this is just the set of indices for our fact, for our terms. And then we have our outcome variable here. And then in this case, what I'm doing is I'm simply providing the standard deviations on the regression coefficients and the outcome. Um, in a real world situation, you'd probably want to model these, but I thought I'd keep it simple for this. Um, and so much like before, this code has been cut up for presentation purposes, but the complete script is available online. Um, and so next we'll go through our parameters. So we have our regression coefficients, our main effects are the group one and group two betas. And then gammas and deltas are our latent factors. So we declare their dimensionality here. And then the transform pr predictors block is a variable that you're not estimating, you're calculating. That is, it's, it comes from an operation on other variables. So here what I do for the linear predictor is, and this was why I created the matrix of indices, is so that what we'll do is we'll go through the rows of our matrix and uh, calculate the linear predictor for each member of group one, group two, and then the dot product of their latent factors. And so what this is, is it means you can use one for loop to go through the whole um, matrix. Finally, this is the model part where you'll declare the priors on your model. So we have our group one and group two betas. And so we're using the same beta sigma there. And then for our latent factors, we're just, what I did here is I treated each row as a normal distribution. This is the equivalent of a multivariate normal model with an identity matrix and the same for the deltas and then our outcome is normally distributed. The mean is the linear predictor and our uh, standard deviation is the Y sigma we provided up top. So one of the other reasons Stan is great is there's this generated quantities block that you can use for model checking. And what this will do in this case, what we're going to do is provide it the linear predictor and simulate new outcome data from the model we fit. And so what this does is this provides a way to check that our model fit well. So we'll simulate a thousand draws from our model um, for each of our outcome variables and then we'll take their means and we can basically look to see how the distribution compares to um, our real data and if it looks like it fits well it should look like our original data so the data I used I used two versions of this one where I had a hundred members of group one and 20 members of group two and another where I had 20 members of group one and a hundred members of group two I used uh, the NUTS, the no U-turn sampling algorithm in STAN to fit the model. That's the MCMC algorithm. I'll, what I will say is I use the variational Bayes algorithm in STAN, which is much faster to initially, to iterate through models initially, but not to do sort of the final inference step. So what I would recommend is if you're fitting models like this that are complex and take a little while to fit, I think this one took probably 10 minutes to fit, is start with variational Bayes, see if it, you know, your posterior predictive checks look reasonable and then go to full inference afterwards. So when we do our posterior predictive checks for our first model, you'll see that they generally look pretty good. Our, the dark line is the, the dark, the dark line is the real data and the light lines are the, are a thousand draws. And so I ran this with four chains. So we actually have 4,000 draws, 1,000 for each of the chains, but I only sampled a um, thousand from that so that it would still be somewhat legible. And the same for model two. One concern with these models is identification. So with the latent factors, the factors themselves are unidentified, which, what does that mean? It means there's an infinite number of possible solutions that could give you the same dot product in your latent matrices. And the reason um, that can be a problem for our sampler, because our sampler is climbing up and down the hills of our posterior, and it might get caught in some local minima. So um, if you impose stronger assumptions on your factors, you can get identification. Um, but in this case, with our unidentified parameters, it's doing reasonably well. Uh, so we can then look at our mean squared error, which is we calculated this from our posterior draws from the generated quantities block. We compared our actual Y outcomes to the predicted outcomes. And we see that our mean squared error is about two consistently which makes sense because our Y sigma we set at two in our model. Now we're gonna get hierarchical. 
So our basic factorization machine assumed all of our parameters were independent. They were all distributed normally with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, and they were uncorrelated. Um, hierarchical models let you share parameters within groups, and you explicitly model the correlation between members. So for example, going back to my country year mod example, you could think of this model the correlation between countries. And this is great because sharing parameters means you're sharing information with the caveat that more parameters means more computation time. So this is the math for a hierarchical model. And I'll walk you through this. Um, so we first have our, outcome, our outcome model. This is the same as it was before, as is our beta model. But for our latent factors, you'll now see that we're working at, with vectors. They're distributed multivariate normal, and we have priors over the means and covariances. So our means are just distributed standard normal. Uh, and I chose this because this way they don't get too big. If you did something like a Cauchy or a student T prior, that's a heavier tailed prior, but the sampler can sort of wander off in space and it won't fit as well, um, particularly because these are these latent factors. So a smaller scale still works here. Um, and then our covariance is decomposed into a standard deviation and a correlation matrix. And this is a little easier, at least for me, to wrap my head around. Um, a covariance matrix can be, is real valued, and I can't really think in terms of covariances. It's very weird to me to think of a covariance as being negative 2,000 or something. But if you can decompose it into a standard deviation and a correlation matrix, those are things I understand. So we use this LKJ prior over the correlation matrix for each of our latent factors. And in Stan, you'll actually work with the Koleski decomposition of the correlation matrix for stability reasons. What that means is we only ask, if you imagine a matrix, which is a square, we only work with the lower triangle, and then we multiply it by itself transposed. And this gives uh, greater numeric stability and fitting. And then for our standard deviations, I use a half normal distribution. Um, so that's a truncated normal, mean at zero, and some standard deviation set by the user. And the same here, our parameter for the LKJ distribution is set by the user. So our data block looks pretty similar to before, except now we have to provide it a bunch of additional uh, parameters for standard deviations and correlations. And so we put hard bounds on them. And one of the reasons the hard bounds are nice is that Stan will throw an error if something is outside of these bounds. So that you know I've used Stan and I've made mistakes where something goes in and it initializes randomly and you get like, it uses negative 3,421 or something. And so it'll throw an error, which tells you that like, you need a type declaration. So now for our parameters, things will look a little different. So we have our non-interactive coefficients again. But then what we'll do is we provide the prior mean, which is an n by k matrix. Um, and we have our standard deviation on our embedding, the um, correlation matrix for our factor. And we're going to use what's known as a non-centered parameterization to fit this model. And I'll detail that in the, on the next slide, but we'll need this additional parameter A. And so we do this for both gamma and delta. And so here our transform parameters block is a little bigger. This is where we're going to calculate our gammas and deltas. And so what this non-centered parameterization does is it moves the mean into the variance estimation and it breaks some of the correlation among uh, the parameters that helps the sampler in STAN run a little more quickly. So, and it, as an example of how this can help is at work I was fitting a discrete choice model and when I moved from a centered to a non-centered parameterization, model fit went from taking an hour to taking 15 minutes. So you do get sizable improvements in speed and model fit from a non-centered parameterization. Um, and then we'll use the same indexing as before to, fit, to calculate the linear predictor. Finally, uh, for our coefficients, we have they're distributed normally with a mean of zero and a standard deviation beta sigma. We have our half normal distribution for our um, standard deviations on our factors. Here's where we use the Koleski decomposition of the correlation matrix. And then for our non-centered parameterization, we just use a standard normal distribution. And for our hierarchical means, um, as before, you know, we'll use a standard normal here and we um, are filling it as vectors. So our outcome is distributed normally with our linear predictor and our y sigma. So when we fit this model, again, we see it fits pretty well. Um, again, you have to worry a little bit about identification. 
Um, but Stan provides helpful diagnostics on that front. And we can see with our mean squared error, again, it's about two. So, so far I've largely so shown you simulations, but now we're gonna fit a model to some real data. So, the data set I use is from a famous political science article called Eth Ethnicity, Insurgency, and Civil War. It's by James Fearon and David Lay Layton. It's a 2003 American political science review article. It's been cited like 8,000 times. Um, and the goal of the article was to understand the relationship between ethnic fractionalization and the onset of civil war. The reason it's great for uh, factorization machine is it's country year data. So you have two categorical variables um, from all countries in the world, 1946 to 1999, and the data and code are publicly available. Um, the initial article fit uh, logistic regression in Stata, which boo his Stata, um, but uh, we'll use our factorization machine. We have to modify our existing factorization machine code a little bit. We'll have to use uh, logistic regression instead of our OLS that we've been using, and we'll have to add a way to bring in additional covariates for this model. We no longer just have fixed effects. So um, the code for this is also online. This code will hopefully be perhaps the most helpful for you if you're using these in sort of a day-to-day -day application. So um, our outcome here is a rare events outcome. There are only about 1% of the observations are civil war onset. And one of the things we do when we fit the model is you base, basically the assumption in the data is that you can only have one civil war at a time. So um, a country drops out of the data set after a civil war onset while it still has a war ongoing. So, what I, I fit the model, I evaluated them using log loss. And log loss, much like mean squared error, mean a zero is better. And so we see the factorization machine um, has a lower log loss. But perhaps what was most interesting to me is plotting this, the outcome, the outcome categories, this is on the left is zero, on the right is one. Red is uh, predicted probabilities from the logistic regression. Black is from the factorization machine. What we see is that the factorization machine, in the case of the one, was much better able to give you uh, probabilities closer to one when an outcome actually occurred. If you occurred, if you look at the logistic regression, you'll see that just about all the predicted probabilities are pretty close to zero, and so it fits better, which is certainly, in my mind, at least an argument for it. And then the other thing that factorization machines are great for is your latent factors. You can plot them because you do have these latent factors. So the first technique I used to plot them was an old technique from the 60s called salmon mapping. And so the advantage of salmon mapping is that it preserves nearby distances um, at the cost of farther away distances. Whenever you pick a technique like this, it's always going to have trade-offs like that. So um, we can see sort of this is the overall plot. And what I'll do here is I'll zoom in on this hairball. Um, and so. One of the things you can do with this is you can evaluate to see if there are patterns in your data you may have missed. In this case, it didn't really seem like it, but it can be helpful as a diagnostic, both to help understand your data and to visualize it um, if you're showing stakeholders. Also, I used a more modern technique known as UMAP, which uh, projects your high dimensional data onto a lower dimensional manifold. Um, it's simply another way of visualizing data. You could also use something like PCA or TSNE. Um, and zooming in here, there might be a pattern, but you know you sort of have to leave this to sort of a substantive interpretation to understand it. Uh, so I wanted to wrap this up. You know, I've talked about factorization machines where you extend your generalized linear models with a matrix factorization on your residuals. And I've talked through two versions, one with uh, factors distributed normally standard normally, and the second where we've used a hierarchical model, and I've shown how to use dimensionality reduction to plot your factors. Everything I've shown so far here, there's only been uh, two interaction terms. If you want to extend beyond that, you have to start to look at tensor factorization, and I wish you the best of luck with that. Um, the math gets scary. But um, one implementation of this I've seen are exponential machines, which are in TensorFlow in Python. So. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for coming. The code and slides are available here, and you can find me on Twitter at my last name. Questions? We got time? Oh, you know there's going to be questions. Right there. Let me grab this. Can you use that one? And sure. Testing, testing.
Hey, how's it going? Um, on the slide where you were comparing the performance of this model versus logistic regression, mm -hmm. are you reporting the in sample log loss? I am. This isn't out of sample. Okay. Did you look at like a cross validated result on this? Not in not in this case, no. Thanks. Do you know, do you know just like in general how how likely this is to overfit versus something like logistic regression? Um, that's a good question. I think um, one of the advantages here is if you do have, say, the country year interactions, is this would be less likely to overfit as the factorization helps regularize your two constituent terms. And I also think this is where like the Bayesian priors can be helpful for their regularizing effect. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm struggling to understand just because of how the latent factors are set up. Like, in, in a real case scenario, when I have domain knowledge, I, I, have, I wouldn't really know how I'm supposed to construct priors on factors which would reflect the domain knowledge that I have for the graph. Does that make sense? It does. So the question is, um, how do you put a prior on a latent parameter when you have domain knowledge? Is that? Yeah. So that's. There's no one right answer to this. A lot, in a lot of cases, the best way to think of it is to sort of be conservative with your model fit. That is, you do want to pick something. Um, if theory tells you sort of you think certain dimensions will matter, so in our five-dimensional model, if you think if you're in say psychology and you're doing factor analysis on personality types, you might set a distribution that reflects say an ordering, or that reflects that you know you expect one thing to dominate the others. So. Or if you don't know, say, the number of factors, you could use a sparsity-inducing prior, something like a horseshoe prior. And what that'll do is force um, parameters towards zero if they're not adding additional information. You have two. If you don't have enough data, right? The the, the hierarchical model is probably not going to resolve anything. But if you have, you know, a ton of data, Bayesian models get really difficult to run at that at scale. So what what types of scales do you would, would this model be effective for? So, um, so I would say at least as I've implemented it, the thousands of ob thousands to tens of thousands. Um, it's also not instantaneous, particularly. If you don't care about uncertainty estimates, you could estimate it with stochastic gradient descent and just get predictions. But if you wanted to do um, sort of a full Bayesian model like this, it'll take a little longer. If you wanted to, also if you wanted to use variational Bayes, it'll fit a lot faster. So the models I was fitting here, as I mentioned, I think took about 10 minutes using MCMC. They took about 30 seconds to a minute using variational Bayes. And so the trade-off is variational Bayes sometimes fails in weird ways. Um, but the upshot is, is it's fast, and you can do these sort of calibration, you know, posterior predictive checks to see if it's working for you. Thanks. Always here today. Oh. I wonder if you would care to share a real world, real world question that you've answered with. So I haven't used these on a real world question yet. I sort of took this talk because I wanted to learn about factorization machines. And it was a great forcing mechanism to commit myself. Um, one place I have thought about using them is um, where I work, we have a big discrete choice model. So a discrete choice model, you have choices and you have individuals. And so you could have, in addition to your standard uh, variables for your covariates, you could have the uh, latent factors in the factorization machine for your choices. A friend who works in election modeling, they do something like that for your choosing between candidates. So you have individual factors and candidate factors. Last chance. All right, if that's the case, I know it's usually a rise I'm about to finish. Someone uh, has no questions, though. Uh, there we go. A part of R, it's a package that you can import from R? Stan? Yes, there's, um, so I use the R Stan package 
Um, and what that is, is it provides the C++ headers for STAN, so you write STAN code, and it takes care of all the passing things back and forth between R and STAN. There's also a Python version called PyStan, if you prefer Python. And what's great is STAN itself is its own language, and it works in its own script, so you could write both a Python wrapper and an R wrapper to the same STAN script. And Julia and Command STAN. Yeah. And I think there are a couple other links. Yeah, and there's Stata Stan too. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to share some my reaction. So I'm computer science undergrad, and I have I coded many years. And then I'm in banking, management consulting. So I never went deep. Uh, this presentation itself looks scary to me. And you said there's a simple math, uh, more advanced. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure uh, how to go about, go about taking a you deep dive. Yeah. Mm. You keep coming and you learn this more. Uh, speaking of you want to learn, if anyone wants to learn STAN, we usually have an annual STAN workshop as part of the meetup. Uh, we didn't have this past year because we need to find space. But as soon as we find space for a three-day workshop, maybe, yep, uh, we're going to be putting on a STAN workshop by the people who develop STAN. Talking Jonah Gabri, uh, Andrew Gelman is usually involved in this. Um, Rob Tranguchi, every year changes up a little bit, but it's like Jonah and Andrew are pretty much mainstays. That'll be coming up maybe March or April, maybe. We're we'll going to work on that in a second. There was a hand here, and I'm working my way down over there. Thanks. Thank you for the talk. My, this maybe is a bit too picky. If you go back to the slide with the model written out, the hierarchical or? Yeah. Yeah. This one? Yeah, I, I maybe I just didn't absorb it. On your muse, you have variants of one. Mm -hmm. um, why? Um, partially because that's how I simulated it. Partially because I wanted a. Partially because that's how I simulated it. So I wanted to see if you know it worked. If I if I knew what the answer was. Partially, it was also because I wanted a more conservative fit here. Simply because those are the muse on the latent factors. And so I didn't want the latent parameters blowing up in the estimation. So is it, but is that, OK, I wondered if it was reflective of the scale of those latent. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. what it is? Yes. Oh, OK. Yeah. I saw him first, and I'm working on the back tree. So I was thinking if, well, for those who are sort of just coming to this for the first time, if you could suggest one reference in Bayesian statistics that would on-ramp somebody into this. What, what book would that be? Yes. So Statistical Rethinking by Richard McElreath. Um, the second edition is coming out this winter at some point. Um, I'm not sure exactly when, but it is a fantastic book. And part of the reason it's great is he's an anthropologist. So he writes a book for someone who wants to use this but sort of trusts the math works. I compare it to... A lot of Bayesian cookbooks sort of start, or Bayesian uh, statistics books are like cookbooks that assume that you have a cow you need to slaughter and then you need to build a fire. <laughs> Statistical rethinking uh, is like you have a kitchen and you want to cook a hamburger. Can you spell the surname? Uh, M-C-L-E-L-R-E-A-T-H. Mm. And I'm pretty sure the meetup group had like a study group around that book a year or two ago. And there's a GitHub repo under the NY Hackr GitHub organization of the people who are working on that. Michael, were you in that bagel locker? Uh, yes, I was. Yeah, so talk to him afterwards. He can point you to where the GitHub repo is or how to copy the book if you want to go in there. That too. Oh, well, yeah, you got a student instructions edition, didn't you? Yeah. 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 So that's, yeah, that's a very popular book. I'm going to go in and I'll work my way back. What's the publisher? Um, it's CRC, CRC yeah. It's CRC. the Red Book series. Oh, you Thank you. Uh, can you put up the very first equation, please? Yeah. Uh, oh, was that the very first equation? You had an equation where you had the Y. Uh, and yes, that's the one. Mm-hmm. Um, and you talked about needing the interaction with beta 3 and so on. Um, suddenly, I had a flashback to doing uh, analysis of variance where you lump together the interaction with the residual 
if you um, if if the if the interaction uh, if the interaction is so small that it's insignificant, if the, the corresponding sum of squares is so small that it's insignificant. So I was wondering, how do you know that beta three actually matters? Um. So I think there are sort of two ways to answer that. One is, you know, you can sort of look for, say, coefficient size or some measure of uncertainty on the parameter. Um, the second is sort of substantive. If this interaction is sort of substantively meaningful to this, say, the decision you're trying to make, that would be what you would use. Or um, there's something inherent in the application domain yes. that points to beta being beta three yeah. being non-zero. Yes. Thank you. Richard Bugbeck strikes this. If anyone actually wants to do a study group about any test out there or any topic, the meetup can help facilitate that. We have you know the Slack channel for the meetup. We will have we have lots of uh, private repos on GitHub you can make out use of. And if there's like small groups, you can even find space for you at night to hang out and study the stuff. So if you actually are interested in doing a study group about this or any other book that's out there, uh, get in touch with myself or Amada or Michael, and we'll sort of help facilitate that. And Michael is good. Yeah. yeah. We, a group on that would be great. Yeah, Michael, maybe you want to revive the group on that one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can revive that. If anyone has an interest in that, come talk to us. We'll add you to the Slack channel. We'll start another GitHub repo and have at it again. Or any other book, too, by the way. There's so many great things out there. Thomas? Why did I play Thomas, not Thomas? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Um, now that we're, well, why did you call me Thomas? Oh, because you're so formal. Oh, I see. Um, <laughs> Now that we're going on sort of tangents, I'll go even further. It seems like maybe you've tried out a lot of things for fun. I have 128 gigabytes of RAM on my computer, and I only use like eight of them because I write really efficient code. <laughs> so can you recommend what I should play around with and stand that would use my memory? Um, <laughs> something with a lot of parameters. So you could try taking something like this and scaling it to a really big data set and seeing what that could do for you, something like uh, one, of, uh, one of the, say, film prediction data sets and seeing what sorts of hyperparameter com combinations or different sort of shrinkage priors, how those can affect model fit. Thank you. No, not TensorFlow, because I, I, I only have $5 GPU. You know what would be good? Um, oh, I'm oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. You know the cover of BDA3, Gelman, Gelman and Ribbon's book, that has a birthday problem? Yeah. Not mm -hmm. a birthday problem, but like um, an analysis of birthdays? Basically, uh, there's a parameter for every single day of the year. So there's 365 parameters, plus you have lots of other parameters. So the model has, like you said, a lot of parameters to go estimate. It'll probably fill up your RAM pretty nicely. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you got BDA3. Great. They hand all the way in the back. If you can shout, go yeah. for it. Yeah. So this is a very general question. I think, uh, yeah, you can shout louder, use the mic. Um, this is a very general question, and, and not, but someone else is asking about the scale. Sure, so the question, um, for those of you who didn't hear it, was basically if you have really big data, do you need Bayes? Is that a fair? Um, and so it's a good question, and I think if you have, you know, say a million um, independent observations, you probably don't need Bayes, but if you're in a situation where, say, you have lots of subgroups in your data, um, and you may only, so you may have a million observations, but it's because you have 100,000 groups with only 10 members each, that might be when you'd want Bayes, because then you can do something like the hierarchical modeling that would let you share information across your parameters <laughs> and sort of further improve your estimates. Can you even agree to show? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so at a high level, I liked um, modeling to answer questions, but I'm happy to give you a more in-depth answer offline after the talk. At the bar. Yeah. Well, you're an undergrad still? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I just want to make sure you only go to the bar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right, anyone else? Yeah, one more lap because, you know, that one last minute question, possibly 10. 
All right, cool. With that, let's see a big round of applause. Thank you.